right, I think we should get started now. Um, so I just want to welcome everyone to the Gardening with Native Plants class. Um, thanks for spending an hour here with us on such a nice day. Um, if you weren't here for the Rain Garden class, I want to introduce myself. My name is Megan Festuca. I'm an environmental specialist with the town of North Hempstead. Um, I work on many different sustainability projects, um, including creating native plant pollinator gardens in our town parks. Um, before we begin, I just want to remind you that you're muted. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box at any time during the presentation. And then we're going to stop at, at a few different intervals and we can answer questions. Um, to reach the chat box, just hover at the bottom of the Zoom panel and then you'll see it says chat. You can click on that and then um, a sidebar will, will pop up where you can type in your questions. Um, we are recording this workshop, so if you um, want to go back and watch it again for any reason, you can do so. I'll be probably sending a link out sometime next week. Um, so now I would love to introduce um, our presenter, Rusty Schmidt. Um, he is a landscape ecologist for Nelson Pope and Voorhees. He's also the president of the Long Island Native Plan Initiative. So he has a lot of knowledge on the topic that we're discussing today. Um, he has also worked on many different projects involving creating native plant gardens and rain gardens all over Long Island. He's extremely passionate about his work and always helpful to me whenever I need him uh, for any questions about native plants working for the town as well as putting them in my own yard. So Rusty, I will stop sharing my screen and then you can share yours and take it away. Okay, sounds good. And before I share, you can all take a look over my shoulder. Uh, that is uh, the uh, meadow that we created at the Sisters of St. Joseph property in Brentwood. Um, it's a pretty cool property, uh, 1725 Brentwood Avenue. You can visit while uh, during daylight hours when they're open and uh, go through their meadow or the rain garden or a whole bunch of other really cool things. Uh, this meadow doesn't quite look like this anymore. The black-eyed Susans are short-lived perennial um, uh, that are the native one that's behind us. And so there, it's not nearly as yellow anymore. It still has yellows in it, but uh, not from Black Eyed Susans. And uh, they have a whole bunch of other things that are going. So let's start. Okay, so I gotta find my presentation one second. My shared screen turned off. There it is. <clears throat> Um, so uh, we're just going to talk about native plants and how to protect, how to use them to protect wildlife and what's going on here in Long Island. So why natives? Most people believe it's because of the birds and the butterflies, and that's true, and uh, that's important, and I'll get into that in a minute. But there's other things that are so very important with uh, uh, native plants. Um, the first thing, though, is uh, they were here first. So this is an aerial map of where I'm from in Minnesota. This is uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. This is the seven county metro area. This area, uh, yeah, this is the Mississippi River. Um, this area is the same size as Long Island uh, with about the same number of people uh, as Long Island. And, uh, but what the different, and you can see what it was like uh, back in the day uh, before pi the pioneers came. Uh, so the dark green is the big woods. So Laura Ingalls in the big woods, that's uh, this area. It would be maple basswood forests, uh, uh, oak uh, openings, oak trees, and then uh, all the dark blue are lakes. The dark uh, orangey brown color is oak openings and oak barrens, not very much different than what you see in the pine barrens, just without the pines. Uh, and then the prairie is the light yellow. Uh, and then uh, the wetlands are these brown areas. Uh, so that's what was there. This is what's left. Uh, those purple areas is all that's left of all that space thanks to uh, development. So again, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and you can see that um, most things have been uh, disturbed. It's uh, here, uh, and the reason why I'm showing that is those were the plants that were found there. Similarly, here on Long Island, what we have are two different biomes along Long Island. Uh, the North Shore and most of Nassau County is um, uh, was the Hempstead Plains and the coastal uh, uh, forests. 
So uh, coastal forests, the North Shore, would have been mostly dominated by trees like tulip trees, uh, the black and red oak, beech, black birch, um, red maple, things like that. So for instance, the, the large woodlands uh, uh, that is around uh, the Unitarian Universalist Church on Shelter Rock is a tulip beech forest. The Comset State Park and the North Shore is mostly um, some tulips, oak, uh, coastal oak and uh, uh, oak and um, um, birch and beech tree forests. So that's what would have been the main stories underneath would have been things like dogwoods, sweet gums, pin oaks, things like that. Um, then uh, uh, and, then, and things like um, black cherry. And then underneath that would have been the forest floor, which would be things like uh, ferns, uh, geraniums, gingers, um, uh, things like that, that would have been found on the, on the forest floor. Uh, the east end of Long Island, which we're not gonna talk about much, but uh, is the uh, Pine Barrens, which is the other part of Long Island. So that was, uh, this is what was here a long time ago as the climax uh, uh, species. The Pine Barrens was this big area in the center with a small area of the dwarf uh, pine plains, which is very, very unique, um, only found on Long Island. Uh, then this uh, large area, most of Nassau County was the Hempstead Plains. It used to be 50 square miles. There's 13 acres left. And that 13 acres is over by uh, Hofstra and Nassau um, uh, Community College. This is what's remaining total. So that little yellow bit right there is what's remaining by Hofstra. Uh, you can see that these yellow areas were the natural, uh, that's all that's left of those natural communities. Not much different than what I showed you in Minnesota. It's And you'll notice that most of these places are associated with um, uh, uh, with uh, parks uh, uh, like Comset State Park up here um, or um, uh, Kinequa or things like that and or the Fire Island area. Okay, so we've, we've destroyed a lot. Even though you can see that most of Long Island is still pretty darn green, it just uh, has been modified significantly and it's not native anymore. The cool thing about native plants is that they're used to our temperature, our weather, uh, 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 cold winters, warm summers, wet springs and falls. This is what they're used to and they're, and they're associated with these, uh, this area and can handle the area pretty well. The other thing about native plants is their root systems. Most of our native plant root systems are much, much deeper than uh, the non-native turf grass. That turf grass that most people have in their front yards are, is very shallow. It's only a couple inches thick. Um, uh, it's uh, two to three inches maximum where the roots are. Most of our native plants have roots that go much, much deeper. And the reason why that's important is that it has the opportunity for water to soak into the ground. It has a chance to clean and cool that water. Um, as water soaks in through those deeper rooted plants and has a chance to be uh, take the nutrients out, the heavy metals, carbons, um, uh, carbon uh, sequestration, which is allowing the uh, roots to hold more carbon. Uh, it's, it's all around better in that the structure of the roots make uh, the plants more adaptable and better for the system. Um, our plant roots that we are used to seeing, um, so trees have roots that are only a couple feet deep but go very, very wide. Um, and, and you've seen that last time when Sandy knocked over a whole bunch of uh, trees or the last storm, you saw that there's this pile of dirt that's about two, two feet thick that are at the base of the tree. And that's just, uh, that's, that's how trees work. They don't have big tap roots. Uh, they have roots that go far and wide, and the reason they go far and wide is to uh, balance that big sail of leaves that are above their heads. Where on the other end, the perennials and uh, uh, shrubs and uh, flowers and grasses all have roots that are deeper. Uh, they don't have that big sail. They don't need to do that, and they're looking for more water deep. Uh, looking for more nutrients deep and, and actually creating more uh, uh, healthy soils underneath the soils. 
So Kentucky bluegrass uh, or turf grass has two inches up, two inches down, but our native plants um, uh, have roots that can go anywhere from three or four feet to seven to 15 feet. So uh, this, my favorite one on this list is lead plant. You can find it right on the high line in New York City, silvery gray leaves, purple flowers, and have roots that can go 15 feet deep into the soil column. If you don't quite believe me in the graphic, you can see, uh, see them in real life. This was a demonstration that was being shown at the uh, uh, Washington DC's Botanical Gardens. I was down there a number of years ago uh, with my daughter for spring break and this was uh, the demonstration that they had. This is about eight feet of roots and you can see many of the roots are tied up. These are plants across the United States. However, many of these plants are found right here in Long Island. There's a little blue stem right there, about six, eight feet. Uh, that looks like switchgrass, about eight to 10 feet. Um, and this looks like big blue stem. It goes down, uh, well, no, that can't be. Uh, big blue stem goes down about eight feet as well. Uh, this must be some kind of um, river oats that can go down about 15 feet. So I have a question um, and I'm gonna, if you have an answer, um, uh, thinking about the United States, what is the biggest crop by acreage across the United States? Um, and I'm actually okay with you unmuting and giving an answer quick. Any guesses? I don't think people can unmute themselves. I think uh, everyone, but people are typing in. Corn okay, so perfect. Far. Okay, so that good. Box, if you want to type your answer, someone said lawns. Ah, you already got the right answer. <laughs> so, so lawns, lawn grass is the biggest uh, crop across the United States. Um, they, they're by acreage. Um, if you add up corn, wheat, uh, soybeans, um, potatoes, cranberries, blueberries, apples, everything, uh, uh, ginger, you take all of those crops, you add it up by acreage, it still doesn't equal the same amount of acreage that is uh, found here in the United States in lawn. And lawn is a crop. We water it, we fertilize it, we take care of it, we just don't eat it. Um, we allow geese to eat it. Um, and we play baseball or lacrosse or soccer on it, but that's about all the benefit we get from lawn grass. We have converted uh, 62,500 square miles um, uh, uh, to suburban lawns, which is about eight times the size of New Jersey. And we have developed about 2 million, and we develop another 2 million acres every year, uh, about the size of Yellowstone National Park into lawn grass. So today, suburbia is, uh, it has very little biodiversity. We are pretty much have lawn grass, and then occasionally we have a few tr native trees on the property that most yards along Long Island, and especially in Nassau County, is less than 5% um, uh, native plants, um, and uh, on, on, on average, and typically. And uh, I was reading uh, some new articles recently um, that there's new science out there that's suggesting that the lack of biodiversity is actually a contributor to the, pan the current pandemic that we're in um, and other human uh, health concerns, that there's a million species that are on the brink of going extinct across the, across the globe. And they're saying uh, they originally thought that biodiversity would actually cause um, pandemics, and they're actually seeing it's the opposite. By having that biodiversity, you're actually having a better chance of keeping things transferring from animal to animal and potentially getting to humans and having uh, these uh, widespread issues. So our challenge here is to redesign suburbia to make it more healthy and functional for the ecosystem, but it also is more healthy and, and friendly for us by capturing carbon, you know, uh, reducing the load of pollutants, providing habitat for our critters, and a few other things. So how can we do that? Uh, this is a uh, suburbia area. Um, you can see the lots are kind of small. Uh, this is not Long Island, but it kind of gives you an idea of, uh, of showing what we're gonna do. So if this is a standard development across the United States, what could we do to find biodiversity? So watch this image as it's gonna change in front of your eyes. 
all that new green and uh, gold areas are all possible places to put biodiversity back into that or back into the neighborhood. So I'm going to do that again. Those are the opportunities. So you start thinking about that. We could potentially get um, anywhere from 30 to 70, 80 percent new biodiversity on the property. They were, we can get back to a new ecosystem. And I'm going to tell you, lawn grass in suburbia and the plants that we have at the nurseries that are not native are changing the ecosystems across the globe and especially in the US in suburbia. And the problem with that is that because the nurseries don't sell native plants uh, for the most part um, the, uh, here in Long Island, um, they are selling the plants that everyone is used to seeing. Um, we've actually modified the ecosystem. And where that eco change in ecosystem starts is at the insects. Insects are the, are the most important group of animals um, across, the US, or across the world. And it's mainly because they transfer energy captured by the plants and uh, putting it back to other animals. So um, you have these, uh, these insects that are eating and taking energy out of the, the plants then the next uh, critter eats that and you slowly move up the food chain. And that's how we work our way through the, the system. And the insects are very, very biodiverse and uh, very different. And they're all very important. There's just a small handful that are problematic to us as humans. Most of them are very, very beneficial to us and our health. So the next piece to that is that 96% of our terrestrial birds uh, rear their young on insects and especially caterpillars. Uh, so uh, they, uh, so our birds are a good indicator of how we're doing in biodiversity, because we can see the birds and see what's going on with their populations. We can understand what's going on with the insects that are a little less uh, 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 easier to observe and count. So here's our birds. Uh, each bird uh, a family. Uh, terrestrial bird family, they, re they eat mostly caterpillars and they actually eat about a caterpillar every three minutes or about 6,000 caterpillars per brood of birds. Uh, and so some birds like that chickadee in the bottom right, this guy uh, actually has, uh, they raise two broods in a year. And so what they're, and so that's 12,000 caterpillars that they need to have to eat. Um, and so putting this all together, the next piece is our caterpillars, our insects, 90% of them require some part of their life cycle that they are associated with a native plant. Uh, and that's called a host plant. So for instance, this, uh, most people know this one on the right. Uh, this is the monarch caterpillar. The monarch caterpillar needs milkweed. If you don't have milkweed, you can't have monarch caterpillars. And if you don't have monarch caterpillars, you can't have the monarchs. Um, the, the reason behind that is the, this caterpillar is eating the milk, uh, the milkweed leaves, the stems, uh, it's sucking in the, the milkweed sap. The milkweed sap is poisonous to almost everybody, including us, if we eat enough of it. The caterpillars then are immune to it and they actually build up a toxicity in their bodies. The reason why monarchs are so brightly orange colored is to tell the world that they're poisonous, do not eat me. Uh, you might know this one. This is the black swallowtail on the left. The black swallowtail, some people plant dill and parsley for the black swallowtail, but actually its uh, host plant is in the same family, which is golden alexanders found on Long Island. And so if you have those plants, you, have, you can have uh, these um, black swallowtails and then have that butterfly. But all, mo almost all insects, 90% of them, need some kind of specific plant in their life cycle to, to, uh, to get through maturity and develop. If you're not poisonous, um, sometimes you, ha you have to be able to hide. So the upper right picture, this is actually the arborvitae caterpillar found on an arbor arborvitae plant. And you can see that they look pretty identical, so they can hide that way. This is on the left is the liatris caterpillar on the liatris flower. And on the right, which is hard to see, 
This is the laurel caterpillar on a laurel leaf. So you can see the white stripe on its back. That's a little different colored than the uh, vein of the, of the branch. And you can see that they, once it's on the leaf, they can make themselves disappear pretty well. If you're not poisonous and you're not in uh, hiding, you have to be very abundant. And so, um, meaning uh, some of the plant, the, some of the animals that you've seen, insects that you've seen, like inchworms, uh, right about now, the inchworms are starting to uh, fall from the silk on their, on, out of the trees. And there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And the reason why is most of them get eaten uh, by, uh, by birds. And so they, if you're not, you gotta be abundant to be able to surpass the, uh, the being a prey uh, victim. So every time we plant an alien plant and an alien plant's a plant that's not from this region, we are reducing the local insect population. And by, and the studies have shown that in areas of, um, predominantly alien plants that we've actually had 35 times less caterpillar biomass, which has had a big effect on our birds. And Cornell University here in Long Island, or here in New York, has seen that uh, depending on the ecosystem, that there's been a reduction of 30 to 55% uh, reduction of bird populations, depending on the ecosystem. And that's mainly due to the insect loads that are allowed to be available for the birds to eat. So that's kind of the, the, the big push towards um, really looking at native plants for the insects. Um, uh, a good demonstration plant for this is um, due to climate change, we are able to have a few plants more now and a few plants less. So you probably have noticed that if you've been here long enough that there doesn't seem to be very many paper birch across Long Island when they used to be quite prevalent. Uh, per paper birch is a zone six to uh, three, uh, three to six plant. And uh, we have changed from a six B to a seven A, seven B zone here on Long Island due to climate change. And so the paper birch is not surviving the heat of the summer. And we have pretty much lost most of the the uh, paper birch across Long Island, um, a plant that has been adapted to Long Island that you most likely know about is the crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle is really a North Carolina plant. It's uh, been uh, genetically modified a little bit to be able to uh, handle 7A, 7B. And you notice in the last 15, 20 years that crepe myrtle is one of the most popular trees that people are planting in their yards for their beauty. The negative about the crepe myrtle, though, is because they have not developed here, they have not developed in um, uh, over millennia a uh, biodiversity with the insects that are here. There's very, very few insects that uh, utilize the crepe myrtle other than some bees for the pollen. There's no other uh, insects that really from here on Long Island that use it, utilize it. So what you've really done is you've planted an alien plant in your yard that doesn't have that insect value. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It just means that it's uh, not as productive as some of the rest of the yard. I'm gonna say here from here on out that I'm not telling you you have to go 100% native of plants in your yard. What I would recommend though, is let's get that higher than what it is now. You might be at zero or 5%, let's get up to 20, 30%. My real goal is if we could get everyone across uh, Long Island to convert their lawns and yards back to 75% native plants, we'd have a new ecosystem um, back, uh, back closer to what it originally was here in Long Island and get closer to allowing uh, these insect pop populations to get back and then our bird populations to get back. And again, most of our insects you don't even know about and they're beneficial. We just need to have them back for our birds and then the rest of the system. So if you have no other way, uh, no, nothing better to do uh, than plant one tree in your yard, uh, here are the caterpillars that are most associated uh, with uh, those plants. So for instance, the oak tree has 534 different species of caterpillars that are associated with oak trees. Many of them are those inchworms, for instance. Uh, uh, black cherries, 456, willows, birches, you can see the list going down. 
Um, uh, Ginkgo, uh, I'll throw this out there. Ginkgo is from uh, Japan area. Ginkgo is uh, only has two known, and it's been here for, uh, ginkgos have been planted here in the States for over 100 years now, and there's only two uh, insects that are, uh, that it's being host to. So even though it's been here almost 100 years, it still is not uh, producing the opportunity for caterpillars like these other trees. And you see some shrubs on here too. Uh, blueberries are on this list and uh, things like that. Okay. Uh, perennials, flowers and grasses. Uh, goldenrods are best. Um, uh, goldenrod has 115 different caterpillars associated with it. You can see asters, sunflowers, uh, all these are a bunch of natives. The one thing that's not native here is the morning glories. The person that created this um, is further south and more, where morning glories are native. So morning glories are on this list, but they're not native here. Uh, to get a better understanding, bringing nature home is uh, this information I passed on is kind of a a culmination or a reduction of the information that uh, Doug Talamay wrote in his book. Uh, it's a great uh, read. He's a doctor from Maryland uh, that is, uh, and this book is a very easy, very uh, uh, understandable read to understand why native plants are so important. He's got a new book out. Uh, I cannot remember the title off the top of my head, but that's uh, there's a, he's got a couple books out now. Um, and uh, they're very understandable of why natives. Once you know the natives, the next book that you might want to consider is from Heather Holm on the right, Pollinators of Native Plants. And this really helps you understand, uh, you can look up the plant and what is it host to? What kinds of insects are, um, does that plant host? So you can then look it up. Okay, I really want X kind of butterfly. Uh, let's say you would like the spice bush uh, butterfly you would want to put spice bush uh, bushes into your yard. And so you can go either way, look for certain insects or look at certain plants and what insects will they bring in. So talking about host plants, and I'll stop here in just a minute uh, to answer questions. Host plants, uh, the Luna moth, one of my favorite moths um, and absolutely stunning uh, moth uh, needs the walnut family, hickories and sumacs. Uh, to to develop. Painted lady butterfly is probably the most top, <coughs> excuse me, the most dominant uh, butterfly across Long Island. <coughs> excuse me. And um, if uh, and that butterfly needs uh, yarrows, uh, pearl everlastings, the native thistles and the native mallows. The mallow is uh, the the native hibiscus. Uh, the buckeye butterfly needs um, plantains, toad flax, snapdragons, uh, false uh, loose strife. It's probably the most beautiful butterfly on Long Island, in my opinion, but maybe the ugliest caterpillar. Uh, the hackberry butterfly needs hackberries. Uh, there's the so southeast blueberry bee. It needs blueberries. If it doesn't have blueberries, you don't get the southeast blueberry bee, for instance. And then my favorite butterfly that most people overlook are all the little azures and blues. Um, its host plant is New Jersey tea, uh, probably the most underutilized beautiful shrub that people don't use. Um, it's only two feet tall, blooms in June and July. Um, it um, has the, uh, there's little black seeds and berries that come and the leaves, the, the seeds, berries and leaves. Um, come out later in the season, and they can be used for teas. In fact, the colonials used it as a tea. Um, and so it's an amazing plant. Um, it has everything going for it, except for maybe the name New Jersey. Just kidding. Uh, it's, a, it's a really cool plant, and I uh, very much enjoy using it um, in many of my properties. So I'm going to stop there for a second. Does anybody have any questions? So we just have a few comments so far. Um, someone said they live in New Hampshire, so we're having a wide reach with this presentation. Ah, um, okay. And they purchase native plants from the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, Massachusetts. So that's great that you have a place to purchase them where you are. Yeah, we don't have as good a spot like that here in Long Island. So 
good for you and congratulations. And I, and I'm glad that you're doing that. Yes, me too. Um, the other part, someone also said that the Doug Tallamy book that you were referencing is called Nature's Best Hope. So if anyone That's right. I that couldn't out. remember. Thank you very much. I couldn't remember off the top of my head. Yep. I, I've read that one too, but I just couldn't remember the name. Very good. Okay. I don't see anything else at the moment, but please, as we're going through, definitely type in any other questions you have and we'll stop again soon. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, so now that we've talked about butterflies, I want to hit bees for a second. Um, uh, bees, uh, uh, 99 times out of 100, when somebody gets stung, they're stung by uh, wasps, uh, not by bees. Bees don't sting unless they absolutely have to. So uh, that meadow that's over my shoulder, I actually go out and count bees and butterflies in there. And uh, the bees are so loud, I can't... Uh, uh, it, it, it's just, it's, they're so loud. There's thousands of bees when I'm walking through there and I'm constantly pushing them away and trying to count them. And I have uh, survey points that I walk through and, and I'm, I'm literally kicking them up all the time and I've never been stung. Uh, bees don't sting. In fact, I even pet the, uh, the big uh, bumblebees. Um, they don't really, they, they're not interested in you. They're interested in their flowers. And uh, so long as, uh, you know, you don't capture them and put them in your hands. Um, you're, they're not going to hurt you. The other th and and there's a whole bunch of really cool bees that most people don't know about. So these two in the middle, they're actually bald face bees, um, and they 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 eat the nectar and pollen just as like other things. And so I usually try to explain what um, to uh, to our young humans or our youngsters of why bees are so important and start to get them to start looking for them and seeing that they're not, they're not the scary bits. The wasps are different. Um, wasps broke away from bees uh, millennia ago and uh, bees are, are uh, vegetarians. They eat uh, pollen and nectar. The, the other bees, the wasps that broke away, they are carnivores uh, or omnivores. Um, and so they eat other, most wasps eat other insects and again, will not sting you. So the threadleaf wasp eats uh, spiders, the, uh, uh, or thread wasted wasp, sorry, thread wasted wasp eats spiders. Um, there's uh, cicada killers that eat just cicadas. Remember the, that crazy wasp that uh, the hornets, that the crazy, you know, death hornets or whatever it was that has come to the United States. Again, they eat other bees. They're not gonna sting you even though they look scary and they look like they're gonna hurt you. They're not interested in you. The ones that you're most worried about are yellow jackets. 90 time, nine, nine times out of, a, uh, uh, out of 10 or 90% of the time when you get stung, you're stung by one specific wasp and that's the yellow jacket. The other 10%, most of the time, again, it's the paper wasp, um, uh, the ones that have the big nest. And they don't sting you unless you hit their nest or bother them or get too close to their nest. So it's really just being cognizant of where you are and, and what you see and, uh, and, and start observing what's going on. These, these uh, wasps uh, and bees are very important for our, our health. The bees, if, you don't, if they don't pollinate our flowers, we're not gonna get the fruit that we eat or the vegetables that we eat. And if we don't have uh, some of those wasps, we're gonna have some of those undesirable insects become more dominant in our landscape and go around. So for instance, my favorite wasp is the one that eats um, cockroaches and they don't bother you, they just like cockroaches. So just think about what you're doing and what's going on and, make, and understand that most of these insects are very, very beneficial and wanna be around uh, where we are because of the, uh, the habitat we're providing for them, and they're not going to hurt you. Most uh, most of our bees are um, ground nesting bees. So when you see the holes that are just too big for ant holes, um, and you don't see ants coming in and out of them, they're bee nests. Um, so I was uh, working in um, uh, Calverton on Monday and Thursday this week, and I every three to five feet was one of these holes that had uh, that we had solitary bees coming out of. Um, and they look like they're all plaster bees um, uh, that I saw, but I'm sure there's other uh, uh, species that were there as well. 
They tend to have a single hole, uh, including our big bumblebees. Our big bumblebees are also ground nesting. And they tend to have a single hole and they have four to eight uh, places for them to grow their larvae for the next, uh, for later in the season and the next year. There are a few cavity nesting bees like the big uh, Eastern carpenter bee, um, the mason bee um, and others that, uh, that uh, build their stem, uh, build in uh, uh, stems or in uh, cavities and build their homes that way. Um, uh, one of my favorite bees that I love looking for is the sweat bee. It's probably as big as the end of your pinky. It's not very big at all. Um, and it uh, loves the little fallout flowers. It's iridescent green. It's not black and yellow. Um, and or iridescent blue or coppery colored, and they are and they're they're small, and they uh, pollinate so many of our flowers and fruits. It's uh, really important that they're out there, um, and they're and where they nest is in the stems of your plants uh, that are out in your yard. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to talk about maintenance about your plants in just a little bit. So before I do that. I want to let you know that the town of North Hempstead and Megan specifically has been working with um, uh, the Nassau Water Conservation District to have a native plant residential rebate pilot program. Um, it's not official yet. It's, it's still uh, coming in the works. Uh, but as you have registered here today, uh, she's going to send out a note when it's ready. Um, you can visit the NorthHempstedNewYork.gov backslash sustainability to learn more details in the next coming weeks. Um, they have received a grant for 5,600 bucks from Nessa Soil and Water Conservation District. And they're looking to have residents replace um, uh, their yard with native plants and or build a rain garden. And they will, they're looking to do about $500 maximum per household uh, to, uh, to pilot this new rebate program. Um, did I miss anything, Megan? Did you have anything else you wanted to mention? No, that sounded pretty good. Um, yeah, so it, it's really going to be a great program. We hope that, um, you know, if everybody applies for $500, we'll get at least 11 new pollinator gardens on Long Island planted. And um, if not, if people, you can, uh, you can apply for less money if you want to do a smaller garden and um, then we can get even more planted. But um, I encourage you, um, once I release all the details, like Rusty said, I'll, I'll send out an email uh, to everyone that has registered for this presentation and, and to get all the details about that. So, I mean, the, the money will be just to buy the native plants. Um, you'll have to do a little bit of work on your end. You'll have to kind of come up with a plan, which plants you wanna get, um, a, basic, a basic design of your garden to apply. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, if you're interested, it should be a great program. Um, where to find plants? Um... There's a couple of good local nurse, uh, there's a couple of good retail nurseries that sell predominantly native plants, Long Island natives in Eastport and Warner uh, Nursery, which is out in Southampton, neither are close to uh, where we are, um, but um, uh, you can see their websites. Um, and then also Limpy, who um, the pre I'm the president of the Long Island Native Plant Initiative, acronym Limpy. Um, we have a fall plant sale coming up. Um, what I would recommend, though, is that you go to their websites um, and see what plants are available, contact them, order before you go. Uh, they will pull your plants, have them ready for you. So when you drive up, they just load up your trunk. Uh, you can still go shopping after that. You still can have your impulse buy, but you're not overspending or um, buying plants so you don't know where they're going to be placed later. So um, that's the, my recommendation. And then uh, if you're going to do the rebate program, you're going to need to do that anyway. You got to have a plan. And so I would recommend that you, you uh, plan it out ahead of time. Um, uh, I do know that uh, Dick's Nursery in um, uh, Huntington over by East Northport has natives now. Um, Hicks Nursery has some natives, mostly cultivars, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, and so you, it, it, we're having a harder, hard, uh, we're having a hard time getting plants uh, available. Um, it, uh, 
for natives, though, I'm going to tell you there's more and more uh, folks and nurseries starting to uh, uh, provide native plants. And what I would recommend is if you're looking for something from your local nursery, ask, 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 ask. When they provide it, you have to buy them. Um, the only way we're going to change the system is to actually get, is to request the plants and then purchase them. Uh, the nurseries only sell uh, what they think they're, what they think they can sell. They're not going to take on uh, plants that uh, don't go anywhere. So you have to, uh, you have to ask and then you have to purchase. So that's my suggestion. Um, other programs that also provide plants in your area, the Rewild program is in the Port Washington uh, Peninsula. You can go to rewildlongisland.org and they are helping folks do convert lawns to natives and they have a native plant sale coming up uh, or just just started, I, I can't remember what, but they they are doing something with that as well. And that's another program that you can, uh, if you're unable to get in with North Hempstead, you might wanna look at Rewild. Uh, and then if you're way out East, uh, two thirds for the birds is a new um, and perfect earth are two new um, directions that are um, trying to make it pesti pesticide free maintenance and, um, and trying to get to two thirds of your property and native plants for the birds. Um, so uh, I think a few questions have come up. I'll, I'll stop there and then we get into all the pretty pictures. Yes, let me go scroll up and just make sure. Okay, so someone wants to know if we wanted to seed our lawn with something more native, do you have any suggestions? And they said, if we can get away without mowing it even better. Yeah, so um, uh, you can convert your yard uh, with seeding um, for a prairie. It's very or a meadow. It's 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 harder than you think because it's uh, when the plants are only an you know inch or two tall. Which one is the weed and which one are the plants that you want? I lean more towards planting in plugs uh, over that, and I'm going to show you a bunch of yards that have done that. Um, the other option is there are um, sustainable grasses that you can plant um, that don't need weeding. Um, so for instance, there's, uh, it's hard to get from seed. So again, it's better to plant in plugs or small plants. Um, uh, Pennsylvania sedge for the shady areas, um, um, path rush for the sunny areas. Um, those are two grass-like looking plants that you can walk on that are only three, four inches tall. Great, thank you. Um, so someone would like to know if we could provide a list of recommended plants for a suburban Long Island garden and where they can be purchased. Yep, so uh, that will be part of the um, uh, uh, paperwork that's coming out with the rebate program. So we have a list uh, that will be part of that. So that's the first part. So that would be easier than trying to go through that whole list right now. Uh, and then purchasing plants. I've kind of hit a couple of nurseries. We're hoping to get more and more nurseries on Long Island providing these plants. Yeah, with the rebate program, there'll be a resource that was actually created by the Long Island Native Plant Initiative about um, with some more details about where you can purchase plants. Um, Obviously, it's difficult to know exactly which nursery has which plants, so it's it's kind of hard to say even, you know, at the time of year, they might have different availabilities of plants. So it's hard to say, like, this plant is available at these places because we, we just really don't know. And, and until you ask them, it's you can't really know that. Mm -hmm. um, someone talked about their students um, IDing plants using the GoBotany web website from the Native Plant Trust, and I've used that website for it is great. So thank you for that. Um, I, I use iNaturalist as well. That's pretty good. Um, so that helps yeah, as well. I've used that too. Um, let me see if there was another question. No, I think that was it. Okay. So um, uh, the rest of the way is kind of this how we do things. Um, so I really like uh, this, um, this meadow-like planting. Um, it's kind of large. Um, uh, there may be a weed or two in there, but you can't tell. Um, and uh, but not everyone's taste. But I do like uh, having these larger uh, spaces. Um, simple gardens. Uh, here's one that we did a little one. Um, I did it with students. 
Um, I showed this earlier. Uh, I didn't realize I had it in there twice, but I showed it in the ring garden talk as well. But this one, we just killed the grass by smothering it. I personally like putting down cardboard down and then, and then mulch over the top to smother the grass and kill the grass or other plants. Um, I just did a half acre of smothering with cardboard and mulch um, in Calverton when I was out there this earlier this week. Um, I get I got rolls of of cardboard that were 250 feet long and three feet wide and then put mulch over the top 140 yards. Uh, but for uh, your little yard, go to Costco. You can get cardboard for free that are three foot by four foot um, pieces. Um, they uh, you just get at the end of the day, go through there. And what it is, is it's the cardboard between pallets and they just uh, recycle it. You can they will give it to you um, and you can get hundreds of pieces, throw it in the cart. They won't charge you. Just walk out the front door with it and bring it home. And you just, and if it's three by four, that's 12 square feet. You just get the area divide by 12. That's how many pieces of cardboard you need. And then mulch, you just put the mulch over the top, two to three inches thick, and it holds the cardboard in place, but it will help smother and provide nutrients over time. In this case, once we got the mulch in place, we planted. Uh, each student got six pack of plants and a trowel, and they planted them a foot apart. Uh, and this is what it looked like a year later. Uh, so all these plants, uh, most of these plants are native to Long Island. This is wild bergamot, this pinkish flower, Monarda fistulosa. This dark purple flower is um, Agastache funicula, an anise hyssop. Uh, this yellow plant in the bottom is the native black-eyed Susan. This is pale, pale, pale purple coneflower. It's not native to here, but it still is available and works really well. That's Echinacea palata. These purple flowers back, uh, uh, back here are Joe pie weed and marsh uh, milkweed. This taller dark purple one is ironweed. All three are good ones for here on Long Island. This tall yellow one is yellow coneflower retibita. And this is a native uh, uh, sunflower. This looks like um, Helianthus um, maximus, so a little taller one. So these are a couple um, uh, plants that would all work here uh, uh, for your garden as well. You notice that they're all kind of tightly packed. That's when we planted them a foot apart. I tend to plant 18 inches apart, um, but uh, we wanted it as fat and robust as possible to keep away the invasive or uh, you know, weeds because we knew that these wouldn't be weeded very much. This is a garden that we planted with two plants, shrubs only. And, uh, and because of the, the maintenance person was not gonna be able to maintain. So by doing it in shrubs, we just said, if it's not a shrub, you kill it. Uh, we have red twig dogwood in the middle and uh, low grow sumac around the outside. If I were to do this today, I would add maybe some viburnum, some maybe um, some evergreens like a bayberry or an inkberry. Um, I might add that New Jersey tea that we talked about earlier or a dwarf bush honeysuckle um, uh, around the outside edge just to have a little more diversity. Here's a garden that was all natives planted up by the road. Menarda is this, pink, this um, uh, lavender flower. Uh, we have a, a purple cone flower and a black-eyed Susan. We have native grasses here. That's a little blue stem. Um, we have uh, an ironweed in the back corner, and it looks like Joe Pye weed is about to bloom here in the front. This one's all in shade. Unfortunately, I got here during the little two week period where nothing was blooming or very little was blooming. There's a mountain mint that's blooming here, but this is all gonna be orange with uh, Michigan lily, which is a native, uh, kind of looks like the tiger lily, which is not native, um, but, uh, but had uh, orange uh, flower, but it is upside down. Uh, the flower head is upside down and the petals uh, turn up. It's actually much more beautiful in my opinion. Uh, and native. Uh, the, there's a bunch of ferns here. This is sensitive fern. Uh, it looks like this is Culver's root. This is going to be white flowers here. It looks like there's geraniums over here, a wild geranium. 
Uh, there's a native sage in the back, which is that gray uh, looking grass, uh, which will have purple flowers. Here's one in sun. Um, Coreopsis is this yellow flower, little blue stem hanging over the top. A blazing star is done blooming uh, in the back. This looks like aromatic or New York aster. I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, it could be either. Uh, uh, aster in front. Um, so these are all beautiful native plants that grow together. Uh, this one's in Kansas City, but uh, all the plants uh, in this picture can be done right here as well. Uh, most of these are shrubs uh, late in the fall, so you can see the fall color. We got some blueberries, which is that dark red. We have some sumac. We have um, um, uh, some uh, bone set flowers still blooming. So we have a few different things going on in here. Um, you all read where this one is uh, before I have to say that. Um, we designed this garden. It's all uh, predominantly native plants. But uh, when I was hired by Target, the first thing Target said is we can't hide the sign. So instead, what we did is we pointed at the sign. So all the plants are in rows pointing towards the sign. And so when you look at the plants, you can't help but go up and look at the name of the sign. So um, all the plants uh, do that. And there's a series of gardens that, uh, one, they're rain gardens. They take the water off the parking lot, but they're all pointing at the sign. This is, uh, uh, wouldn't you like to stand at this car wash, waiting for your car, watching the bees and the butterflies coming in and out while you're waiting? Um, or this one is, um, uh, this again is a rain garden, but over here is all uh, native plants. Um, this is a native brown-eyed Susan. We have some Menarda. We have some um, mountain mints. So you can kind of see what's going on here. And then you can see the rest of the garden and yard. And the only piece of grass this gentleman has is this big. It takes him five minutes to mow with a real, uh, uh, real lawnmower, the one that rolls and spins. Um, and he likes to sit out here with his lawn chair and a book underneath the shade of the tree with uh, the birds coming in and out. What I have noticed is that when you start planting with native plants, um, what happens is you go out to weed and you pull out one weed um, and then you tend to have a smile on your face. You've added no water. You've added no fertilizer. You've added no pesticides whatsoever for the entire property. And you spend more of your time with an adult beverage or a Diet Coke and a smile. Um, it's just uh, mostly native plants. What I've, this gentleman had left a big chunk of his yard open for lawn uh, because he had his grandsons coming over every day to play soccer in his backyard or hang out with him in the backyard. And then everything else around it was all native plants. His sons are now at college and he's, or his grandsons are now at college and he's slowly converting the rest of his lawn into more and more natives. This is a very large area. Um, so this is an adult daycare uh, across the way by this weeping willow. And then beside me, from where I'm taking the picture, is a assisted living facility. And this was one big lawn that they mowed all the time. Uh, so what we did is we converted the lawn into a series of native gardens um, throughout this entire area. Um, uh, it has become very little maintenance. Um, once all the plants establish, weeds can't really get in there anymore. Um, the, uh, there's a bunch of paths through it. So uh, the adult daycare folks get walk through here and the uh, assisted living folks, can, if they can traverse the area, they walk, but more often than not, they sit on their decks and watch the birds and the butterflies come and go. We've expanded it a little bit since then. Unfortunately, I took this picture in November when everything was browning up and, and, and uh, uh, getting ready for winter, but you can see it was uh, quite, uh, quite uh, luxurious with colors. This one is in uh, Riverhead. Uh, this is all a native plant garden at the Master um, Cornell Extension Office with the Master Gardener Program. 
This one's in Muttontown here in Nassau County. Uh, we have Anis Hyssop, Black Eyed Susans. Um, we have um, Black Chokeberry. We have Little Blue Stem. We have Switchgrass uh, in there. Uh, there's a whole bunch of Mountain Mint that's in here and um, a Bone Set a little further on. That's just not blooming yet. And if you go back month to month, every two weeks, the garden looks different from different things that are blooming. So this white flower is uh, bone set. You can see that the grasses um, are a little bit more established. And I have a feeling most of you would really like to know what's around that corner. So when we design, I'm always trying to um, uh, give you ideas or peaks of what's going on and getting you to think about, you know, let's, I want to, I want to traverse the area. I want to walk through the garden. So there's a few non-natives like these hostas here and that peony and these, oops, um, I bumped the line, uh, these marigolds, but most of the rest of the plants are native. Uh, probably about 75% of the plants are native. And this is a very expensive home with a full meadow in their front yard. Uh, blazing stars are the purple flowers. We have that native sage. We have um, different uh, um, daisies and um, uh, purple cone flowers, black-eyed Susans, a whole bunch of different things going on. We have some cardinal flower and um, uh, some uh, different asters and some foxes. And I start to, uh, when you have that backyard, I start to get people to stop thinking about putting the meadow. They, this has a very large backyard and they wanted to put a meadow way back here by the fence line. And I said, why do that when you can put it closer to your deck and enjoy it more and, and get a better uh, look? The other thing that I'd like to point out is this kind of purplish grass that's starting to turn purple right back here. It's called purple love grass. It's another amazing flower that's underutilized. This is a transformation of a small house in East Meadow. So the lawn has been removed um, and replanted. And this was early spring 2019. It was just planted. You can see the plants are small. And coming back fall, look at how uh, full this is. It's a little blue stem, Coreopsis, um, Baptisia, some. Um, this one is a, 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 an aster, looks like aster lavis. Um, so there's just a ton of different kinds of plants going on and change the complete look of this uh, front yard. This is at Clark Botanical Gardens. Uh, we have black, uh, we have goldenrods and um, turtle heads. These are these white flowers. Uh, there's Joe Pieweed. Uh, so you can see on the bottom right when we just finished planting it, and then you can see the two uh, uh, larger pictures of close-ups of those plants. I think I'm out of time, right? Yes, so I'm a little over. So um, I'm just going to show some pictures. If anyone want, has, uh, I'll answer some questions if there's any extra questions. Otherwise, I can just click through a few more pictures as we're going. Um, as of now, I don't see any questions, but as we're wrapping up, um, if anybody does have any last questions, please put those in the chat. And then Rusty, if you wanna just show a few more pictures and then that should be it. Okay, sounds good. Um, so we have a little more formal garden. We're planting in big patches um, to get that look. This one is a screening between the homes, but I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. Um, there is something I want to want one more thing to point out. Um, a great place to get some inspiration is actually at the uh, High Line in New York City, and I'm pretty sure I have that here. Yep, here we go. So I like to plant in big patches, drifts, or, uh, you know, so 
having fewer plants but bigger numbers or little smaller numbers and repeat um, so that you can get um, a little more balance or you get a little more impact from the plants when you're doing small gardens. So for instance, this is um, a one black section of the High Line. Pate Odoff, who was um, uh, a mentor of mine back in Minnesota, uh, designed the High Line. Um, and so uh, you can see that this is his uh, design. There's 20 species that he has in this one black section that is repeated. Um, Pate designs in this style where it's big blocks of plants, when they are showing off, they really have an impact. And my favorite is one of his that he did in uh, Missouri. You just want to walk down that trail, and it almost looks like a Monet of plants uh, planting in uh, big groups like this. So here on the High Line, he did the exact same thing, big groups of plants, repeated patterns, utilizing the space uh, for uh, 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 able to walk, but still have these amazing gardens to walk through that is very narrow and uh, but feel like you're in amongst uh, the uh, a different ecosystem. You remember that lead plant that I told you about earlier that had very deep roots? Here it is. Here's that silvery leaf, purple flowers, booms in June and July, has very deep roots, but we might not have the space for deep roots here just because they can doesn't mean they go 15 feet. In this case, they probably only go about three feet when they run out of soil, they just don't go any further. And I really want to talk about cues of care, having that path, having that wall, having that little bit of grass, um, lawn grass that uh, actually in, uh, makes your garden look a little more desirable, even when they're newly planted or more established, um, having that wall or making it look more deliberate. And by having a, a deliberate looking garden, you'll avoid any of the neighbors saying that's a weed patch. When you put that, in this case, you put the, the split rail fence um, with a random planting, you can see that it it enhances the garden and makes it look like it's a garden and not a weed patch. Same with this arbor in the bottom right. Or putting in uh, uh, a little walkway across or a bird bath. This is, you know, my attempt at being zen. Uh, we just got done planting. Um, at it, now it's just fully grown. You can't see. Uh, you actually saw the picture fully grown earlier when it had the sensitive fern and the culver's root. That was uh, bad timing on me visiting. <laughs> but this, this a little bit of split rail fence here makes this look more appropriate. This is a little village hall uh, with its garden in front. And this is a garden at a school. And this is one at a lake, a little bit more large, again, planted in flowers, uh, planted in plants, not as a seed mix, but the split rail fence really, one, keeps the lawnmower from going in there, but second, uh, makes it look a little bit more on purpose. And you can see that, again, things are planted in patches. And I like putting things in layers. So that we have a, a front layer, a medium layer, and a back layer uh, going into the woods. And or if you have trees, like these pine trees start to lose their leaves at the bottom, planting laurels or other things, um, um, blueberries, inkberry, kelmia, um, mountain laurels, things like that underneath can fill in that space. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, uh, is there any other new questions or? No, I don't see any additional questions. Um, I would like to thank everyone so much for joining us today and Rusty for this great presentation. Um, I, I also wanna say that we, again, we recorded this. So I will be sending out a recording to everyone who registered. So if you missed something or you wanted to go back and watch it again, you can do that. 
Um, and with the rebate program, even if you don't want to do, you know, apply for the rebate, we are going to be having some great resources for creating native plant gardens, like the plant list that we were talking about before, as well as one that will give you, you know, some instructions on how to design and maintain your native plant garden. So just keep a lookout for that soon. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for your, your comments. Um, they're, they're great. And uh, we hope that you start to put some native plants in your yards. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Have a great day, everyone. Enjoy it. It's beautiful out.